Hello, everyone. Hello. Okay. Thank you so much for coming. I'm happy to present Maria Uriarte. She's coming from Columbia University. She received her master's degree in environmental studies at Yale. Then she did a PhD at Cornell, and after that she did a postdoc at the Cary Institute. Uh, she studies the dynamics of forests in response at human natural er disturbances, and today she's going to talk about the effects of the Hurricane Maria in the island of Puerto Rico. With that, I let her to talk. Thanks. Thank you, Natalia, and thanks for the invitation. This feels like teaching, where all the students are in the back, uh, <laughs> running away from us. Um, so anyway, uh, thanks for the invitation. I'm going to talk about the work that we have been doing in Puerto Rico for the past year or so. Um, and here are a couple of pictures. Uh, this is the tip of the Yunque National Forest, completely denuded after the storm. And this is Andrew Kuberman, who was an undergrad here, actually, many years ago, student in the lab, kind of looking up and saying, what the hell? Um, so um, as you may know, cyclonic storms, as they are known, are the uh, main natural disturbance in coastal forests across the Caribbean, uh, in Asia, where you have high densities, and they are called typhoons. Um, in Northern Australia and in parts of the um, Indo-Malaysian um, area. And um, in Asia, they are known as typhoons. In the Caribbean, they are known as hurricanes. And in fact, the word hurricane is a Taino word, uh, which were the original inhabitants of Puerto Rico. And that was then translated into a number of languages. So um, as you may know, one of the expectations of a warming climate is that we're going to see the, the what feeds hurricanes is the temperature of the ocean um, and some atmospheric dynamics. So what you can see here is an increase. What you can see here is that my pointer doesn't work. Uh, but there's a link there on top between um, the tropical Atlantic uh, sea surface temperatures and the adjusted uh, tropical storms. And so what we're seeing with um, a warming climate is uh, sort of what is called the, an increase in the dissipation power of the ocean. So you can think about this as the engine that feeds hurricanes. Um, and so the projections for the North Atlantic are that we can expect anywhere from 10 to 15 percent increases in wind speeds, and with much more certainty than for wind, about 20 percent increase in extreme rainfall associated with hurricanes um, by um, you know, the end of, uh, of this century. And as if you read Nature and Science, you will see that these kinds of papers about whether um, you know, cyclones are associated with the storms are the subject of very active debate in the climate literature, but regardless, um, you know, we need to be able to deal with these very extreme events and their effects on ecosystems and people. So um, one of the questions that, that many people had after the 2017 hurricane season is whether this is what we can expect. The 2017 season, we had Harvey in Texas, uh, Irma in Florida, and Maria in Puerto Rico. Are these storms? the result of a warming climate, or is this just normal variability? This is not a question that we can address with certainty, even though there's been some attempts to do that in the climate literature. Um, but we need to think about what are the possible implications for ecosystems. Puerto Rico, of course, um, is no stranger to hurricanes. Uh, if you live in the Caribbean, there are salsa songs that were written about hurricanes. There's books written about hurricanes. There's all kinds of folklore about these storms, right? Um, this is the history between 1851 and 1998. Um, the last hurricane to hit of the category of Maria to hit the island uh, was um, Hurricane San Felipe, which was a category five storm in 1928, um, and then um, Hurricane San Silpian in 1932. Because hurricanes exhibit multidecadal variation in their, in their frequency, um, we had a period of 57 years where we didn't have any very severe storms uh, making landfall on the island. Until in 1989, Hurricane Hugo hit the island. After that, Hurricane George's in 1998, and then again, Hurricane Maria uh, in 2017. Um, Hurricane Maria was a category four storm, um, almost a category five. He missed it by one mile per hour. It would have been a category five. Um, here you have the picture of uh, the storm uh, going across the island. The effect that it had is it was the largest blackout in US history. There's a still parts of the island that continue not to have electricity. This was a project that NASA is carrying out in sort of tracking the, the evolution of uh, the electrical grid in Puerto Rico. Um, 
$90 billion in damages, 15% loss um, in, in gross national product, the number of lives and whether they were the result uh, lost the result of the hurricane or subsequent to the hurricane is still the subject of, of much debate. Uh, it's estimated that about 200,000 people have migrated or left the island, often people with um, you know, high levels of education um, and uh, tremendous uh, toll on the sort of emotional infrastructure of the island, uh, if you wish. Um, in terms of forests, um, here are some pictures from Tanagud from before and after the storm from the uh, top of the Yunque forest. Um, you know, one has to ask, well, what does this mean? Um, so these forests are adapted uh, in a lot of ways to these kinds of uh, events. And so um, the question um, that we have to ask is they are adapted to a particular regime of return intervals and frequencies and severities of these storms. If we start having uh, storms of the category of Maria four or five returning every 20 to 30 years, is that enough time uh, for the forest to actually do what they have to do? In particular, for tree species to grow to the size where they can reproduce, right? That's the key feature uh, of forest. And the other question that we have to ask, and this is something that is of great interest from the point of view of, of policy and so forth, is, um, what are the risk factors that determine the spatial variation in damage, right? You can drive around the island and you will see some areas that are much more severely damaged than others. So we have topographic factors, we have climatic factors, we have species factors, and oftentimes these are confounded. Um, so how do we address, you know, those, those questions? So in the talk today, I'm going to ask essentially three questions. First, um, at the island level, we're going to look into the factors that determine the severity of damage across the island. Um, second question is, what is the selective pressure of hurricanes on a species composition? In other words, what species will be the winners and losers uh, in this forest? And what does that mean for the long-term composition of these forests? And that's empirical. And third, um, using models, what are the implications of these selective pressures on forests of an increasing uh, frequency of severe storms in terms of carbon and biomass uh, recovery. So the first question, this is uh, the work of my student Jess Hall, um, is based of course on remote sensing. Um, so here are some pictures uh, based on, on a Landsat composite uh, collected before and after Hurricane Maria and if you squint you can see that the picture in the bottom has a lot more brown uh, than the picture on the top. And if you look at a, at a series of um, enhanced vegetation index, which is an index of greenness from 2000 to 2017, each of the gray lines here is a year. Uh, the blue line is the composite of the 17 years, and the red line is Hurricane Maria. So you see a, a precipitous drop in greenness at the passage of the hurricane. And people that were in the island describe it as there wasn't a single leaf on the trees. Uh, I wasn't there when the hurricane came through, but, and then you see very rapid recovery of greenness. These are not trees. This is primarily understory regrowth that happens very, very fast. Um, so to quantify damage, what we did um, is we used these Landsat images to essentially partition each pixel of a Landsat into a linear mix uh, of different components. So you essentially break up each pixel into what we call non-photosynthetic vegetation, which is dead, um, wood, um, sorry, uh, green vegetation, and then we also have a component for soil and, and, and shade. And one of the things that was relatively easy to do in the case of Puerto Rico is that there were a lot of piles of non photosynthetic vegetation, and there still are. So you could drive across the island and find uh, there's somebody here, there's Jazz standing in front of a giant pile of wood uh, because there was a lot of salvage operations trying to get logs uh, out of places and centralized, and they're still trying to uh, sort of sift, shift through this, through this path of vegetation um, uh, to find valuable wood. So using this spectral mixture analysis, we were able to um, devise an index of damage for all the forest areas of Puerto Rico. And this is what shows here in the, in the lower uh, right-hand side. So essentially, pink and blue colors are areas of low damage. These were farther away from the track of the storm um, and suffer less damage. And then areas of high elevation and close to the track of the storm um, suffered 
uh, substantial amount of damage. And of course, this is remotely sensed data, so um, you don't believe it until you have you know, some kind of validation uh, from the ground. And what we did is uh, go to plots, to a number of plots across the island that we've been tracking before the hurricane and measure damage in all of these plots. Uh, so in total, uh, we had uh, 28 plots, uh, a bunch of them in the Yunque National Forest, which is highlighted there with the inset, but also in um, almost all the state forests in Puerto Rico. Um, and we um, carried a survey of damage. So this included uh, survival. Um, some of the trees are killed outright uh, by the hurricane. Uh, damage metrics for all stems that were bigger than 10 centimeters, these are the stems that suffer the brunt of the damage uh, because they are more exposed, they are taller. Uh, the type of damage, uh, uprooting, break, uh, crown condition, and so on, liana load. And all of these trees were mapped and geolocated in the island. So overall, we measured uh, more than 30,000 stems across the island. And we were then able to relate uh, the information that we had from the ground to the measure of, uh, that we had from the satellites. And so um, to get an estimate of biomass across the island, we use a LiDAR product uh, that gives us a measure of canopy height across the entire island. And then we can relate average canopy height derived from LiDAR to the plot level data biomass that we could derive using allometric relations. And then using that information, uh, we could also estimate biomass loss. The relation wasn't as straight as, as the relationship um, that we had for just biomass. But this allowed us to estimate uh, with relative uncertainty that um, the storm either killed or severely damaged 30 million trees. The uncertainty is very broad. It's between 20 million trees and 40 million trees, but it's still a hell of a lot of trees. Um, and that's probably about 15% of the trees on the island based, based on US um, FIA inventory data. Um, and we estimate a biomass loss of uh, 5.28 uh, teragrams. That's again about 15, 20% of the um, above ground biomass that is stored in these forests. So this gives us a picture of you know, the entire island, what happened. Um, and then we really wanted to know, well, what explains variation in damage? If you look here, you see tremendous variation, right? And there's variation that can be explained by proximity to the storm. It's variation that can be explained by elevation, by topographic position, and so forth, right? So what we did is we got um, data uh, from, there's actually really good data now, unlike in the past storms, on the distribution of maximum sustained wind speeds um, and uh, rainfall, total rainfall. Um, and so we were able to get that data and relate it to damage. We also have tremendous variation in geology, uh, with the main soil types being volcanic soils. There are the dominant soil types in the island, but also limestone soils that have very different um, hydraulic properties. Um, and then canopy height. Obviously, the more biomass you have, the more there is to damage. Um, and so that's an important thing. And then we also used a model that we have used in the past, which is a measure you use high resolution topographic data and the direction of the wind to figure out exposure, right? Uh, you sometimes have this refugia where trees, and, and we have some plots in Puerto Rico where, believe it or not, the trees are pretty intact uh, because they were in areas that were protected topographically relative to the direction of the wind. So then we could ask, based on all of these metrics, can we explain a spatial variation in damage across the island? And what we found is, like you might expect, canopy height is the biggest predictor. This is a regression tree analysis. But interestingly, uh, the most important factor after that wasn't wind, but rainfall. And not only rainfall uh, from Maria, but two weeks before Maria passed the island, there was another storm that grazed the island, Hurricane Irma, that brought also a tremendous amount of rain. And the importance of rain was also uh, exacerbated by the fact that the ability of soil to store water was also an important predictor. So these are soils that are saturated with water. That creates instability in the soil, landslides, uprooting, and so forth. So um, and exposure, this model of exposure that we had, didn't explain anything. Um, and so this was also really interesting. It may be because Maria just crossed the middle of the island, and, and sort of it was a broad swath to the island. 
Um, or it may be that our model of exposure is just not that good, and I haven't decided which one it is. Um, so, um, but in any case, um, normally when we think about damage, we tend to look up, right? And all the models of the potential impacts of, of wind, uh, of, of storms and forests, are based on wind and damage to the canopy, when in fact, rainfall appears to be as important, if not more important. Uh, of course, rainfall is taken into account always when we think about damage to human infrastructure, because that is one of the major factors causing damage to human infrastructure. And also, the uh, predictions of climate models for rainfall associated with tropical storm are a lot more robust than the predictions for wind speed. So this all talks about the need to pay attention to rainfall associated with cyclonic storms besides wind. So that tells us what happens at the island scale, right? But it doesn't tell us anything about the selective pressure of trees, of winds on, and, and rainfall on, on forest. So um, for that, we have to go to the detailed plot level data, right? And so um, I've been working in Puerto Rico since 2002, and uh, the LTR, the Luquillo LTR in, in the El Yunque Forest in Puerto Rico, which is uh, circled by that red circle um, on the northeast corner, uh, was established because of the passage of Hurricane Hugo in 1989. Um, so it was established in 1990. And since then, we had Hurricane Hugo, which was a Category 3 storm, 166 kilometers per hour, 200 millimeters of rain. Hurricane George's, that was very similar, but had a very different trajectory. Um, and uh, Hurricane Maria mm -hmm. in 2017, which was almost a, a Category 5 uh, hurricane. But also, uh, we had anywhere from 500 to 800 millimeters of rain that fell uh, with that storm, which is an enormous amount of rain. And these are soils, the rainfall in, in the Yunque National Forest where we work is three and a half meters a year. So it's a wet place. Um, so and the data that I'm going to present comes from the Luquillo Forest Dynamics Plot, which was established under the auspices of the Luquillo LTR. Um, and it's also one of the plots of uh, Forest Geo. Um, and the analysis that I'm going to present is a comparison of Hurricane Hugo, that was a Category 4, and Hurricane Maria, which was a Category um, 4. Did I say 3? Three? 3 and 4, that's what I meant to say. Um, we have data that is less clear for Hurricane George's, although the patterns are similar. And we focused on 24 tree species that had more than 40 stems in each of the storms so that we could have robust comparisons. And this account for about 90% of adult stems. This is not a hyper-diverse forest. Um, so what did we find? First of all, I have to tell you, species have very different responses to, to hurricanes, right? So um, in terms of mortality, each one of these circles is a species, and the size of the circles is proportional to their abundance in the plot, right? In the x-axis is what happened with Hugo. In the y-axis is what happened with Maria. If the storms were the same, we expect all those points to align um, across the, the diagonal line, right? In terms of mortality, uh, we had double mortality on average uh, in Maria relative to, to, to Hugo. In terms of uprooting, it was kind of the same, which was interesting given uh, that we had so much rainfall. Uh, in, in, uh, in Maria, and we think that rainfall creates soil instability and more uprooting. What was striking is that we had anywhere from 2 to 12, 12, two to 12 times the number of stem breaks. So this is a tree that is kind of broken in half. Um, and the only species, there were two species that didn't behave in this way. The one that I have pointed there with the, with the green uh, arrow, that is the palm, uh, Prestoia cuminata, also known as the Sierra palm, um, is the most dominant species in the plot, and it did very, very well. So if you have all seen these pictures of, of the journalist that is reporting from Miami about a storm, and they're like, I'm here in Miami, and there's about a storm that's about to hit. And in the background, there's usually a palm tree. And it's waving, and it's doing all its things, and it's very flexible wood, so when they break, they break. But they have the ability to uh, withstand the storm, and once they lose their leaves, their fronds, because they don't have to rebuild the branches, they can recover very, very quickly. So this is a species that behaved very much the same. The other species, which is that little dot there, is the pioneer, Cecropia chevriana, which also has very high rates of break, but it behaved the same in both storms. Um, so um, 
again, I'm not going to go into the story, but these differences in the, in the behavior were not because we had different size distributions. You could say, well, you just had more big trees or something in one storm and the other, and that's what explains the variation. Because bigger trees have greater drag over the canopy and are more likely to break, um, but that's not what happened. There was also no differences in exposure among the two storms. So what is going on then? Well, um, what we saw, uh, the top here, each of those lines is a species of the 24 that we looked at, and the dashed line is the community average. So what you see, in terms of mortality, it was associated with size in Hugo, but not Maria. Um, in terms of break, there's almost no relationship at the community level between tree size and, um, and the probability of breaking, but there was in Maria besides being higher rates of break. And in terms of uprooting, uh, it was also more associated, although they were kind of similar. So there's something about the biomechanics of the shape of these trees and the characteristics of the storm that change the outcome. And we don't really know what it is. Uh, there's a couple of different possibilities. One is that Irma passed the forest two weeks before Maria and some of the trees lost their leaves. So does that mean that the drag over those trees was different because they had no leaves and then we have some kind of priority effect or contingency effect or whatever you want to call it? Uh, we don't know. We have data now on you know, sort of 3D reconstruction of these species and one of the things that I'm really excited about is to look at how these three shapes interact with sort of the biomechanical, the wind and the ability to withstand winds of different forces, right? Which is really what we're up against. Um, the other thing is that risk factors that were associated with risk in past storms were not associated with the risk uh, in Maria. Specifically, we have trees that have very hard wood, were less likely to be uprooted and less likely to be killed in both the storms. But in terms of break, they only protected trees uh, in Hugo but not Maria. There's no association between wood density and the probability of being broken in Maria. And there were some trees, there's a tree called Malicara Bidentata, which is called Ausubo, that is incredibly dense, really, really hard, and they were just broken in half. So what is going on with these particular trees? Is that related to the characteristic shape of the, of the canopy? We don't know. The other thing to think about, this is data from Hurricane Hugo. So one of the things that we were able to do because of the long-term data, we could look at the consequences in the past. So you have mortality that happens immediately, that is that, that um, red bar there, we have mortality that happens just because mortality happens, right? So under no hurricane conditions. And then you have lagged mortality effects. So this is mortality that trees experience because um, they lose branches, uh, they can't recover their biomass quickly enough, and then they go into sort of like a negative carbon balance, right? So this is delayed mortality. So this is mortality that happened between two to five years after Hurricane Hugo, right? And for some species, this is the majority of mortality. So we expect that on average about 40% of the trees that were uprooted or broken will die over the next two or five years. And so we're kind of tracking not all of the trees, but a subset of the trees to try to understand how that happens and, and when it happens. Um, in terms of selective pressure on forests, I want to return to this palm, uh, the, the Sierra palm. Um, so one of the things that we saw um, is that between Hurricane Hugo and Maria, the census of the plot data that we had, we saw an almost doubling of, of the abundance of the palm in the plot. So why did that happen? Is that the selective pressure of, of hurricanes or is it something else? So with just this plot information, it's kind of hard to say, well, it was the hurricane, maybe it was something else, we don't know. So one of the things that we tried to do, um, and for this I collaborated with uh, two colleagues from the Department of Statistics and also folks at NASA, we tried to use information and a sort of deep learning to try to see whether we could explain uh, the abundance of palms across El Yunque National Forest based on past exposure to hurricanes. So what we did, or what they did, um, we characterized, uh, there was right before the hurricane, we were fortunate enough that there was a flyover of, of the El Yunque National Forest with very high resolution photography and lighter. And then we used this information um, to carry out, if you will, a virtual ecological survey of where these palms were 
and then we could relate the abundance of palms to factors that we know determine the abundance of these species, such as elevation, for instance, but also to exposure to past hurricanes, Hurricane Hugo and Hurricane Georges, and also past hurricanes early in the 20th century. Um, so what we did with that, uh, this is one of the pictures that you can see here. So uh, they were collected, at th this, these pictures are three by three centimeters resolution. So this is the size of a stamp, right? Extremely high resolution. Um, and so we were able to, um, we use this validation of um, the plot data and this uh, thing that is called Amazon Mechanical Turk. So what Mechanical Turk does is you upload a bunch of pictures of whatever you're trying to understand to Amazon, uh, which is you know, the owner of all things. Um, and uh, Amazon um, farms these out to what are called Mechanical Turks. And so these are people that are paid to look at an image and after some training determine if a particular feature of the image is present there. So I'm sure many of you, when you're trying to do something in the internet and you get to a page that says, select all pictures that have a stop sign or select all pictures that have a car, they're trying to determine whether you're a robot or not, right? So they're trying to use your, your visual acumen as a way to determine whether you are a machine or a human. So this is essentially the same thing, except that you're paying people to do this. So um, we did this. Um, and the average time a user takes to segment a, a 200 by 200 centimeter image is 76 seconds. It took us 0.6 seconds. You can imagine that covering and analyzing photographs of the size of a stamp across the entire Yunque National Forest would take a long time if we were to do it by hand. So this is kind of like the way it looks. So this is a submission example. This is a picture that we uploaded to Amazon Turk. This is what our model predicts based on visual learning. Um, and this is what the human does. So our algorithm was as good as the best mechanical Turks, as the best humans that were trying to do this. Then what that allows us to do is to um, create, so this is a result, for instance, of one of our algorithms with the palm in light green and everything else in kind of dark uh, black. Then we can create a palm density. We can create a, a density of palm abundance across the entire uh, forest. And then we can ask, what explains uh, the abundance of palms? And is it related to past exposure to hurricanes? Um, so this is exposure to Hurricane Georges and Hugo, which is based primarily on topography. And then we can ask the, the most important factor in terms of importance, as we know, if you've been in El Yunque National Forest, is elevation. Palms also tend to occur in areas uh, that have a specific topographic characteristics. But after that, we had Hurricane Hugo, Hurricane Georges, and the 1928 hur hurricane, which was a category five hurricane, explaining together uh, the next sort of variable importance. So this doesn't mean to say it's some empirical evidence uh, that this may be associated with past hurricanes. And of course, um, we will be able to address this question much better once we see the, the, the new photographs and, and the new recovery and abundance of, of tree species across El Yunque. Okay, so what does this all mean for carbon dynamics and so forth, right? Um, so for this, um, what we wanted to ask is how will these uh, severe storms affect the composition of the forest, carbon fluxes and long-term carbon stocks? Um, and we also wanted to look at, and this is sort of like what keeps me up at night, um, climate models make two predictions for Puerto Rico. One is that we're gonna see storms of increasing severity, but with much more certainty that we're going to see increased frequency of severe droughts. And in fact, before the hurricane hit in 2015, uh, the entire LTR and many of our efforts were focused to understanding drought. There was a very severe drought in the island. Uh, so how do these two things work together? And in particular, what are the trade-offs in terms of species in their ability to withstand hurricane damage and their response to drought, right? Because if we have, say that we have a drought this year where the canopy is really open and we have a lot of palms, what if palms are very prone to droughts, right? What does that mean for the long-term health of the forest? So for that, we used a, a, a sort of cohort-based model, which is the ecosystem demography model, which is based on physiological parameters and it essentially uses uh, this approach, which are like functional groupings, right? So uh, the basic, 
uh, ecosystem demography model, and then it has, it's based entirely on very fine resolution climate data, so hourly climate data, uh, and the physiology of, of the plant, right? Carbon physiology, I should say. There's a, there's a module that is now dealing with hydraulic properties, but the current version is primarily based on, on carbon metabolism. Um, so what we did for this is we initialized the model with the data that we have from the plot. Um, and then we use physiological data that we had collected in the plot in terms of photosynthesis um, to input into the model. And then we had to develop a new functional group because the palm, which was the most abundant species and the one that resisted the hurricanes more, did not conform to any of the physiological expectations of the life history expectations of any of these groupings, right? Um, so what we did is we first used the damage data that we had from the three storms to figure out the probability, and we, and this is a very frustrating thing, I must tell you, um, the, we had to categorize uh, this model in terms of probability of low damage, medium damage, and severe damage. Most models of disturbance today uh, in this kind of earth system models have no mechanistic basis whatsoever. It's all statistical. And so it's very hard to say what does this mean for another species, right? It would be great if we had some kind of biomechanical property that would allow us to say something about the response to wind, but we don't. And so we use these categories, right? And so this, this is the palm here on the lower, um, and what you can see is that the palm, that line in the bottom, there's very low probability that it will suffer severe damage. And in fact, it's only kind of like a 0.6 probability that it will suffer either light or medium damage. But if it's severely damaged, it has a high probability of mortality. So essentially, these probabilities of, of damage get translated into the probability of mortality in the model, right? And then everything dies, and when you die, all the biomass is returned to the ground and incorporated into the soil. For those of you ecosystem modelers, if there are any, this is essentially the century model, but at a higher time resolution. Um, so what does this mean? Then we use the data to validate against the plot and the model, actually in terms of above ground biomass, uh, plant density, size distributions, and so forth, fits the data quite well. And in terms of composition of the four uh, functional groups, it fits the data quite well also. Um, so what do we find out? Well, um, if we have increasing storm severity, and what you will see there, um, and I'm very frustrated with my pointer. Anyway, um, so you will see those bars, the black bars that are coming up, those are individual storm events, right? And the frequency of those storm events is drawn from a stochastic distribution of severities that is drawn from actual data that we have. Um, and they are grouped together because in the North Atlantic, we have these multidecadal patterns uh, that are associated with larger climatic factors. So we have several decades in which we have an increased frequency of severe storms, and then decades where we have a more quiescent period from the average. So that's what you're seeing there. Um, and the palm is the, is the red line, and you see that it increases uh, after storms, and then it kind of settles down. It increases after storms, and it kind of settles down over a long-term time period. Um, in terms of carbon, um, I present here the historical intensity. This is work done by Sonny Feng, who was a postdoc in my lab. Um, so, Carbon dynamics in a forest that is dominated by disturbance is kind of like an ebb and flow, right? So after a disturbance hits the site, you lose a lot of carbon, uh, it falls to the soil, it's decomposed, it's respired, and then you have a lot of uptake as the forest is recovered. But the idea is that on average, you're gonna be at that sort of like zero level net ecosystem productivity, right? Which is what you get that in that line that is shaded with, with uh, red and, and green. Um, and this is what we found when we look at the historical intensity in Puerto Rico, that is the storms that are primarily, you know, category three, uh, and then a return of a category four in a much longer return interval. And there was a similar analysis that was carried by Fiskeral based on the Eastern United States, and they find essentially the same thing, that you end up with a long-term average across the zero uh, net ecosystem productivity. Um, but when you add um, expected increases in intensity, what you get, and this is, I, wanna, I want you to focus in the, in the uh, blue line in the bottom, is that we are primarily, even though we're sort of grazing the zero uh, net ecosystem productivity line, we're primarily, this is, these are sort of a uh, bunch of simulations, and you're seeing the ensemble average in the, in the black, we're primarily in negative territory. So what, what this means is that we're going from a 
sort of neutral or, or, or sort of sink to a source. So these forests are turning into carbon sources over time with an increased severity if we believe uh, you know, the, the, the climate models. Uh, a lot of what we know here has to do with, um, or what we don't know here, has to do with the dynamics of, of carbon in the, in the soil. Uh, we know much less about soil carbon dynamics in the tropics than we know about soil carbon dynamics in the temperate zone um, because the, these are volcanic soils. Um, the dynamics of movement of carbon through the soil, particularly through the deep soil, are much less understood. And so there's a lot that we don't know. Um, so this is based on a behavior of carbon that may or may not be true, uh, but this is what we expect uh, over time. So, so to summarize, um, the storms of Maria's severity have very different impacts from those of less severe storms. The risk factors that, that we think matter may have shifted. First of all, we have focused on wind in the past, and it may be that rainfall is the thing that we really need to think about much more carefully. And also, characteristics of tree species that protected them in the past may not protect them any longer. So what are, we need to sort of delve into, into uh, what these new risk factors are. Uh, we also know that the severe storms change composition. Um, we don't understand the trajectory that the forest is gonna follow after these severe storms, uh, but we suspect that it has to do with the biomechanical properties of trees. And we need to do a better job in representing the true form of trees and what that means for wind resistance. Um, and relate that to other characteristics, like for instance, physiology and response to drought, so that we can understand the likely fate of this forest under a change a climate regime. And these models show um, that we expect this, carbon, this forest to turn to, to carbon sources and there are more um, severe storms. Um, but again, this hinges on a limited understanding of what soil carbon uh, dynamics are in these forests. Um, and the take home point here is that uh, we have a lot, a lot to do, a lot of things that we don't understand. And we are now following the forests. Um, I was in Puerto Rico a couple of weeks ago and the regrowth is already incredible. Um, and uh, we don't understand what the trajectory will be for these forests and we wanna track the trajectory both at the landscape scale, uh, how we see recovery, um, and also at the stand scale to try to figure out what species are coming in, what is being recruited, how is the dominance changing, and so forth. And so with that, uh, I'd like to thank, uh, first of all, uh, uh, a small crew of, of people that measured all of the trees that did a lot of the geolocation. Um, Gabriela de Llano, who's sitting there, and Jill Thompson, um, and uh, my two students, Jess Hall and Andrew Quevemant and um, our funding sources, uh, which was primarily the National Science Foundation, both through a RAPID uh, and the Luquillo LTR, the Forest Service that manages the uh, Yunque National Forest, um, and Puerto Rico Department of Natural Resources that operates uh, the state forests uh, in a sort of sure stream budget, uh, and uh, the Smithsonian Forest Geo. And I'll take any questions. You know, taking into account the fact that the storms are starting to form earlier as well and starting to, you know, sort of taper off later in the year, plus the fact that that also affects the droughts because the droughts are starting earlier and are ending later as well. Um, is there any sort of fear of this moment of, you know, overlap between the storms and the droughts? Um, I mean, the, even if it goes to an earlier time, and we expect that it will probably see more in September rather than October, which is where we historically have seen the more severe storms. The change in drought that the climate models are predicting is primarily for the early rainy season, which is um, in May. And so what we're seeing in terms of drought is not in the sort of longer rainy season, which is the hurricane season, right? But in the early uh, rainy season. Um, so I don't know, I think there's a few months in between that hopefully will, will save us. Uh, for me, it's more the, what I fear more is to have the open conditions that occur 
um, after a hurricane, which essentially create completely different temperature conditions. After the hurricane, um, air temperatures in Luquillo were four degrees C higher than, 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 um, than before the hurricane. That's a lot of degrees. Uh, so what happens if you have that kind of temperature conditions and a drought occurs? I think it would be very difficult for trees to, to even, you know, it, and they don't change. It doesn't recover in a three-month period, right, or a four-month period. Yeah. Uh, here, I got you the mic. I probably don't need it. Um, what about tree reproduction? Um, you went back all the way to 1928, but palms are just a single stem. If they're going to increase, there's got to be so does that play a role in the uh, in the what the storms do? Absolutely. Um, the so the palms right now in the site that we work in account for about forty percent of the seedlings. Right, it is the most dominant seedling in the understory. Uh, they do very well. So uh, the conditions that we normally have in a Yunque National Forest, in the sites that we work on, is not too little water, but too much water. We get three and a half meters of rain. So this means that in many parts of the forest, uh, the prevalent condition is anoxia, uh, particularly in areas that are flat or valleys. And the palm is one of the few species that can actually appear to withstand anoxia quite well, in part because it has aerial roots uh, that allow it to live out you know, on the top of the soil. And so um, we don't know. I mean, they definitely play a role. There is, as far as I can tell, you know, no dispersal limitation of these palms because the seedlings are so incredibly abundant, um, and that determines, you know, their ability to to reproduce. What we're seeing now, in terms of transient dynamics, and we saw this uh, also in Hurricane Hugo, is a lot of recruitment of pioneer species. We initially saw a recruitment of grasses. Um, those grasses are now dying out, um, and we're seeing cecropias that are already this tall. Um, and so a lot of, a lot of uh, pioneer species that will eventually die probably over the next uh, five or six years. And some of them, however, will reach the canopy and will stick around. Ines. So this is just a curiosity question. The what? Uh, cu curiosity, curiosity question. Yeah, yeah. So knowing what, I mean, your predictions, is there any place in the world that is being hit by hurricanes or cyclones at a regular basis that could tell you about where the biomechanics are going and especially where the current? Yeah, so we have right now, um, it's a collaboration with some folks from uh, Cambridge um, and we're gonna use the, so it's a comparative study between um, Saba uh, in Malaysia, uh, French Guyana and Puerto Rico. Um, and trying to get sort of, and those are areas that have very different exposure to, to hurricane um, uh, dynamics. And so we're gonna try to understand what that means for the structure of the forest. In terms of carbon, um, what we've seen, for instance, if you go to the forest of Taiwan or the Philippines, right, that are hit by typhoons all the time, um, what you have are forests that are shorter and much more resistant to carbon. So it's kind of like a feedback loop in the sense that if the forest can grow, there's less carbon that is assimilated, which means that when the typhoon hits again, there's less carbon that goes into the soil. So the whole carbon cycle kind of slows down and you get more resistant forest all around. Um, so this is what we think may happen. But again, all of this hinges on carbon dynamics and we know very little about carbon dynamics in the soil. Yes. So you mentioned that uh, storms have an impact on human population. So um, interestingly, um, the big, so, so Puerto Rico was at the beginning of the last century and even up to uh, you know, the mid thirties was largely deforested. Um, a big part of the reforestation, the natural regeneration of Puerto Rico happened as a result of a program that was implemented by the government called um, Manos a la Obra, Operation Bootstrap in English. Um, and this created the movement of people from farms to the cities and, a big, and the idea is that there were gonna be creations of factories, people were gonna go in the factories in the cities. What ended up happening is there weren't enough jobs in the city and so people migrated to New York City um, and this is why we have the amount of uh, Boricuas that we have in Puerto Rico, in, in, in New York City. Um, it's unclear uh, what is going to happen right now. Um, I don't believe the people that are migrating now are going from all parts of the island. The majority of the population is concentrated in the coastal areas. 
And in fact, when you go to some of the rural areas in the, in the mountains, uh, you mostly find older people living in these areas. Um, and when you look at some of the demographics, some of the oldest demographics are in some of the most remote areas. So this is the population that is most vulnerable also because they're most isolated and many of them are, are aging. Um, and so um, I don't believe that it's going to have a huge effect on, on reforestation because agriculture um, in Puerto Rico uh, has essentially petered down over the last decades. There is, and, and I know um, John is, is going to, is giving me the, the eye, uh, but uh, the, there are uh, coffee farms and uh, you know, coffee uh, used to be huge in Puerto Rico. It was greatly reduced. Um, now there are farms that are trying to make a living of, of coffee. The, a lot of those crops were severely damaged by the, by the storm. And I can tell you that between last year, um, when I was just there, you could actually find fruit that was grown in Puerto Rico. But last year, pretty much all bananas, all papayas, all mangoes were brought in from somewhere else. Um, so I don't think it's going to have a huge effect um, in terms of the overall pattern of, of uh, forest damage. What we saw in terms of reforestation, deforestation, and this is something that I, you know, Meha also worked on way back when, when she was a student, um, is the sort of dynamics of uh, forest loss in suburban, around suburban areas. Uh, the suburbanization of Puerto Rico is very intense, particularly around San Juan. So one of the things that's happened with the, with the hurricane is we've seen um, some of those areas become less dense. The traffic has improved, uh, there's less cars on the road, um, and it's unclear now how many of the people that migrated are also going to, to stay gone or they're gonna come back. Uh, the majority of the population that is leaving the island is moving to Orlando uh, for the climate uh, because it's much cheaper than New York, the weather is better, uh, and also um, all the parks in the Orlando area uh, create opportunities for employment. Um, so this is what, we, what the demographics say right now. Okay, well, let's thank one more time to Maria Uriarte.